Saturday was sad Surely it was through But since when has impossible Ever stopped you And Friday's disappointment and Sunday's empty too since when has impossible ever stopped you? Hey, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise making dead men walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecost of fire, stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Hey, resurrection power, it runs in my
so in love with you You make me happy You make me whole You take the pain away I'm so in love with you You make me happy Oh, you make me whole And you take the pain away I'm so in love with you Oh, you make me happy And you make me whole Thank you. 
every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom i speak jesus your name is
Jesus in the streets, Jesus over darkness, over every enemy. Shout Jesus for your family. Oh, speak the holy name of Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is light. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
want to give a shout of praise to the Lord tonight. Who's excited to be here? Are you excited? Oh, God is doing something in this place. Hey, I'm so glad you made it. I know it was tough, the Dodgers 60th year celebration and all that's going on and got a whole light taken out across the street by a truck. Church got hit by a car two weeks ago. Naked guy ran into the lobby once, grabbed Red Bulls. I thought he was going to drink them. He just started pouring them on the ground. Yeah, we do have Red Bulls in church. Don't judge us. Um, I mean, like, there's a lot that's happened, right? During COVID, when the Lakers or uh, the Dodgers won the celebration of the championship, the whole building turned into a canvas. And we are a beautiful canvas for people to do art. It was just wonderful. Amen. But you just keep coming back. You just keep coming back to church. Why? Because we get to hear amazing testimonies every service from somebody's life who's been transformed, like Travis and the Men's Discipleship Program. This guy lives at the Dream Center. One year. This is the best team we've ever had right now. Travis. Yes. Hello, church. Good evening. Just wanted to give all the grace and the honor to God for everything that he's done for me. As he created me before he allowed me to go through this journey of many, many valleys, many mountains that I've climbed, he's been right with me during all my addictions of meth, my addictions of alcohol, my addictions of porn, everything. But he's also given me the gifts, the gifts of being able to deal with grant writing, deal with business plan writing, but the thing is, is that he was always there. I held him in contempt from very young age because I went through physical and mental abuses, but it was okay because I know now that he was right next to me during the whole time, and he'll always be, and he's given me these gifts to be able to survive through each and everything. I've been here. My first discipleship, he had me in the potter's house. And the thing is that he, with my brothers, my sisters, my family over here, all my brothers and sisters all over here, he broke a lot of things off being in a potter's house. But now he's rebuilding me. And he's rebuilding me, giving me, knowing that I have the strength to be able to go through and deal with anything. And it's because of the community, I know my identity as God's child. And from this point on, there's not going to be anything. There's not going to be anything that can go against me in any way. But it's that faith. It's that same faith that healed many people back then. The bleeding lady, the leprosies, the blind. And he's still healing everyone around here. And I am one of those miracles. And I'd just like to thank Pastor Matthew over here, all of our leadership with Pastor Brad. We have Evan, Donnie, he's out on vacation, Jake, but my brothers and sisters, we have a plan and we have a hope and he is the one that gives us strength through everything and anything and there's nothing to be ashamed of, of anything. That's good stuff. You may be seated. That's good stuff. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that. What a blessing. How dare Donnie. Leave the kitchen for one minute. No, she. Guy's awesome. Love him. So proud of him. Great to see all of our team. Wait, we have a team. This is rare. I mean, with Easter weekend, how awesome is it to have a team? Um, as we celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus, right? They're coming out and sacrificing, doing Jesus' work. Amen. And so we're glad to have them. Come on, give it up for Church on the Ridge and Snow Quad, Washington. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't say it. I just gave up. How do you say it? Snow Qualmy, that didn't sound that hard. Oh, I read it, it looked hard, but it was kind of easy once you said it. Let's give them all a round of applause. All right, good to have you here. Thank you so much. Honored to have you. Thank you. Tomorrow night, Good Friday service, and we have got some awesome surprises in store in worship. So get here right that early. It's going to be an amazing time. We look forward. And then, of course, this weekend in Easter. Oh, my goodness. We are going. That first 25 minutes of service is going to be so electrifying. I mean, it had to be that good in case I bomb. So it's like, it's guaranteed to be a good service because the first 25 at least is going to be good, right? So uh, come on out Sunday and then uh, tomorrow night, of course, Good Friday, 6 p.m. Show up. You know, I, I really feel that's one of the most, 
one of my favorite services, believe it or not. And that's kind of weird because I'm such like an amped up guy, you know. And you think Good Friday is kind of more like reflective and all that. But I love Easter, but I just love the journey that Jesus took, right? And receiving communion, remembering Jesus, and just, you know, Easter always just brings me, I always just think about the struggle and, and the, the dream that God had for every single one of you. God is dreaming for you. If you lost your dream, he's dreaming for you and and uh, and just gave everything he had. And just So tomorrow night, 6 p.m., a great night. It's going to be an hour long, be in and out really fast, so that can be forever. Um, but it's just, we really look forward to seeing you guys come out. It's going to be a wonderful night tomorrow night. And uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're pumped up at all the Lord is doing. We're going to receive the offering right now, and as we do, I just want to thank God for the hundreds of people whose lives are being impacted every day at the Dream Center. I just got a phone call before service of, uh, the cowboy pastor I was telling you about, the cowboy preacher in uh, Hobbs, New Mexico, and he's a pastor. He said, I got an extra 10,000 came in. He said, a couple of rodeo cowboys uh, said they missed their offering, and they were praying about what to do, and and uh, rather than $16,000 offering the Dream Center, it's going to be 26000 And uh, oh, Hobbs, New Mexico, the, this cowboy junction church. And then I think about our, our wonderful speaker tonight, you know, and he heard I was running this, you know, ridiculous marathon and 48 hours of planning, which was so funny because my mom was like, uh, what are you going to eat? Like, you need to start eating right. I'm like, mom, it's 48 hours. At this point, eating healthy would hurt me. You got to stick to your routine, ride or die with it at this point, right? So I, went right, right. so I just rebelled. I went right to the donut shop. I'm like, you know what? I'm going out. I'm going out all the way, right? But, uh, but Pastor Diego was, uh, was crazy enough to say, hey, it, if you're willing to do something crazy, our church, as we've done for years, our church has supported us, and they gave a $10,000 offering as well. So many, I just say that to let you know that we are loved by so many people. We, and we're not the only ones who care either, right? Sometimes you get to the place to where like, you're kind of like, uh, you know, in a place you're like, man, you know, it's, there's a lot of need. We have, there's a lot of pastors who care as much as we do who have allowed us to go forward for 28 years. Think about that, 28 years. And uh, all the things that we've gone through and all the, I remember we had to cancel a Thursday night speaker because we had like police outside. Remember the encampment thing going on and uh, people do, it just uh, machine guns outside the church and everything. And so that's why you got to come to church. I mean, it's just like, you know, I think we had a guy last week who walked in here with his poster board. He thought he was Jesus. Remember? God, he announced his arrival. He walked right through the building, walked through the front, showed the poster board. He announced his, he was, he was very polite. He just walked in really fast and walked out. So didn't really bother me. I respect the fact, right? He, he got in and out real fast. He didn't like linger. So, yeah, he didn't have to. He didn't have to linger. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but I say all that to say absolutely nothing. But no. But to say tonight, you know, you go through so much. You go through so much, but you just keep serving, loving, smiling, doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I'm really feeling as we just continue to feed so many people today. Have you seen the lines at the Dream Center of families that are lining up to our store that we just started um, after the COVID line? Uh, people go get groceries and all that. And, and uh, you just see people lined up. They're just like looking for ways to make it one more day, you know, and, and just for fun. I was... Uh, it's okay to think about backsliding every now and then as long as you don't backslide. And I thought about backsliding tonight and actually going to the Dodger game. I thought about it. But you can want to quit as long as you never quit, as my dad always says. And I looked at the ticket prices, $150 for the nosebleeds. The worst seat in the house, $150. And I'm like, I, I, I love Freddie Freeman, but I love Pastor Diego way more than Freddie Freeman. Amen. Just a little bit on your teeth now. But tonight, as we receive this offering, uh, I got jokes tonight, right? I'm just, um, I'm up here just, just praying something hits. I don't know. But, um, but as we give tonight, I just, it's, it, the journey is sometimes funny, right? It's not always like pain, survival. It's just, sometimes it's just funny. You got to sit back and laugh and say, man, we've been through so much. And just, you just kind of laugh. Have you ever just laugh and said, it's all you, God? People always come to me all the time. They say, Pastor, whatever you do, stay humble. I say, man. When a ministry has built this slow in 28 years, where you're just grinding out a hospital building, there's absolutely no pride left in you. Not that you're a good person. It's just been taken from you, right? And all you can just simply say is, it's just the Lord. It's the Lord. He's done everything. He's done all of it. He's, he's done everything. And we just keep showing up and do our part. And he just looks at our, our little feeble effort and says, you know what? The heart's in the right place. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to use them to make a difference globally. Dream centers all over the world. 
Um, just so excited to see what the Lord is doing. I got a call from David Meyer, Jason, Joyce Meyer's son. Um, and, and Dave and Joyce are going to come out a few weeks, just visit and walk around the Dream Center. And uh, it's been a long time. And they started at St. Louis Dream Center years ago. And Bob, one of those landmark buildings you can find in downtown St. Louis. And just what happens here? Ordinary faithfulness produces extraordinary breakthrough everywhere. And just your act of giving tonight just keeps one more layer going and one more work of God moving forward. Father, we thank you tonight. We receive this offering. About two minutes, we're going to turn our speaker loose. We are so excited about tonight. Just pray you'd open up our hearts and we would just be prepared and ready for all that you have. Because all that you have is everything that we want. And we thank you tonight for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Mobile app, you can give that way. You can bring your offering down if you like to as well. Let's do our best to trust God and give. Let's get ready for a big weekend for tomorrow night all the way into the weekend. But the biggest night is going to be tonight. Amen. the giver, the sower, the seed, the harvest, the blessing, the turnaround to be a blessing back in return. And I just pray that in the middle of the tough times that we're living in, you would just reveal yourself to people in a way that you've never revealed yourself before of your faithfulness and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, our, our speaker tonight, um, man, he is such a great friend of our family. I just love this guy so much. I love his church. Um, it's been one of the great stories out there in... Um, in what, do you, what, what was the area called? Rancho Cucamonga, but what's the whole area called? Uh, not high, Inland Empire, that's right. And uh, his church has just been such a light and an example. And he's just been one of those guys that's just always been in your corner, you know. And, and uh, it's interesting because he's been pastoring now for 28 years. So in 1994, 93, around that area, just a lot of people came into the city of Los Angeles and uh, this area um, and I really believe that was uh, an era that God used great men like our speaker here tonight. I'm so proud of him. His church is without a doubt one of the most extraordinary work of God. If you've been there, it's just, it's amazing. And this guy just always is the same. He's always encouraging. He always has a smile. He always believed that God can do anything. And I just love people like that. And, uh, and uh, he's, he's brought props and everything tonight all the way uh, from the Inland Empire. And uh, but we're so excited to have. I want you to get, and by the way, I'm just all proud of you for coming tonight. You know, I know that there's options like, you know, with Thursday and Friday this week. People say, well, I'll go Friday, maybe miss Thursday. But a lot of you just are, are showing up to both. I'm just so proud of you. You're the most faithful group of people. You just keep showing up all the time. So would you give yourself a round of applause first? Yeah, that's okay. Give yourself a round of applause. But as you do that. I want you to give a louder one for our speaker here tonight. I'm so blessed to have him. He came longer than anybody to speak, all the way from the end of the empire, which could be longer than flying in from Tulsa or Alabama. Would you give it up? Come on, all the way from Abundant Living Family and Rancho Cucamonga, Pastor Diego Meza in the house. Come on, let's welcome him. Thank you, Matthew. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys may be seated. You're very generous. And uh, absolutely more kinder than I deserve. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, dreams happen here. They don't happen in Studio City, as they claim. <laughs> dreams happen yeah. in Dream Center. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm just so grateful that you're here. And just like 
Pastor Matthew said, you are the hungry crowd that just says one meal a week isn't enough. We want a second one. We want a third one. And uh, it's just a great time this week um, that really solidifies who we are as believers, what this thing is all about that we do called church and prayer and worship and discipline. It, It all revolves around this week. Take this week out of it. And our our faith is just like every other religion of the world. This is, this week, everything that matters, that makes the difference as to why our Jesus is the only true and living God. How many of you are grateful for that? Well, just like Pastor said, we are um, 28 years old like you. And so um, we came when you guys first um, opened or when you were first having services and we came to Dream Center over there. And uh, I don't know if I've ever told you, Matt, but, um, you, you, know, I, 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 you know, you had a bunch of sessions. The, the one session here, one session here, one session here. Learn how to do this, learn how to do this, learn how to do that. I could only handle about two sessions. And I said, you know what? I need to repent. I need to give my life to Jesus. This is just too much, too big, God. And I made the staff stay because they were paid, so they have to stay. And I just got in the car and drove home and wept the whole time thinking, I've been touched. I've been overwhelmed. And just the little I got was enough to propel me to do whatever God called me to do. So you'll never, ever, all of you will never... Uh, We'll never really um, understand how powerful this is that you are part of this. And it's just not for you, but you're influencing people and your story and your testimony is inspiring others that you just don't know what they'll become because of what you became. I feel like dropping the mic and going home now just after saying that. But thank God. Father, thank you for the few moments that I have to be with family and friends today, God. They've not come to hear the lectures or the philosophies of men. Man can't change them. It's the Holy Spirit. So design this word especially for us today individually, and we'll honor you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we said, this week is our pivotal week concerning our faith. And um, Sunday was Palm Sunday, and it leads into tradition, you know, what today represents. And the last week that Jesus walked the face of the planet was in this week where, you know, today he would have had um, communion. He would have had holy communion with his disciples. He would, you know, he would have washed their feet and then he would have been led. He would have went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and at that moment Judas would kiss him and then we have all these mockery accusations that were given to him all tonight leading into 9 o'clock tomorrow until 6 o'clock where he hung six hours on the cross. I've always thought about this. It's not part of my message, but it's a good thing to think about right now. If Jesus just simply had to die for our sins and atone for them, which he did and which he had to, then why did he spend six hours on a cross to do that? He could have just given up the ghost immediately at 901 and possibly have fulfilled the atonement, the sacrifice that he paid. But he suffered there for six hours because the Bible says, by his stripes, you are healed. So he's enduring something and pains for something at that point. So I want to take you back and I just want to read this uh, 10 uh, verses in the Bible which just simply talks about Palm Sunday, what we could relate to it in our relationship with Christ and our communion with Christ. In uh, Luke, the 19th chapter, and I'm just going to start at verse 31. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosening it? And we recognize that's the donkey. Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosening the colt or the donkey, the other three translations clearly say that it was a donkey, the owner of it said, why are you loosening it? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Now let's stop right now. Let's just say that you had a nice car parked in your driveway. And I came and got in your car and was about ready to start it. And, and, and you came and said, hey, hey, hold on one. What are you doing on this? I said, the Lord has need of it. 
How many of you are going to let me drive away with your car? But this is what happened there. So evidently, God was already involved. God was speaking to the owner, and he recognized something different about the request. It goes on to say, that he, drawing near to the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. This is where the phrase, Hosanna, which means save us. So let's, let's, let's kind of do a, a reoccurrence of this. When I count to three at your loudest voice, I want you to raise your palms or your hands because they raise palms, literal palm leaves, and clothes were thrown on the ground, and I want you to say Hosanna as loud as you can. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Hosanna! Now, that was pretty good, but let's pretend like you said it like you won the lottery, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. Hosanna! Okay, thousands of people were along the Jerusalem streets as they said that. And some of the Pharisees called to the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said to them, I tell you that if they should keep silent or shut up, the stones, these rocks, will cry out yeah. praise, yeah. adoration, exaltation, and honor to me. You know, in 1969, we're very familiar with Apollo 11. It landed on the moon. What history doesn't tell us is that minutes after they landed on the moon, two astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, partook of Holy Communion. Why is not that taught in our history books? Now, why would they do something like that if Jesus isn't real? Why on the most triumphant day in history, when you travel thousands of miles in space exploration... I believe they're saying we wouldn't have got here if it wasn't for Jesus. And now we want to invite Jesus into another planet and honor him. And that's really what this day and this week, and that's why I want to invite every one of you to come to Good Friday service and bring a lot of hurting, lost people because the, the time, they are ready now. All your rejections of no that maybe you've done in other Easter services are going to be found differently because people are so fragile today, you'll be surprised that they'll say yes. And be creative. Pick them up and drive them. Tell them you'll meet them in the lobby. Tell them you'll sit next to them. Take them, take them to brunch afterwards. I believe there'll be great fruit from that. Let me talk to you about three people that we just read about in this story now. Three characters I want to introduce to you in this uh, 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 Palm Sunday message that he did on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which was historically what a conquering king did. When they conquered a battle, they would cheer for that conquering king who had conquest over uh, the enemy, and so the city would come out. They thought that uh, he was going to revolt against uh, Rome and, and the Roman Empire that exists and establish his kingdom. But what they were doing was symbolically about a king whose kingdom is far greater than an earthly kingdom. But there are three principles I want to introduce to you, three characters. First is the livestock owner. First is the livestock owner. And here's the scripture I want to share with you today. It's found in Psalms 24 and verse number one. Yahweh claims the world as everything and every one belongs to him. Here are the lessons that I want to teach you first about the character of the livestock owner. The character of the livestock owner is this, is that he understood that even though I bought the donkey, even though I've kept the donkey, the donkey really isn't mine. The donkey is for God's use. The livestock owner would have processed in his mind that Jesus already knew what he had in his barn. He knows what he, you have in your bank account. He knows what you have in your stable. He said, go over there and you will already find the donkey there. I could fool you. You could fool me. But Jesus already knows what you have that you can give to him. Yes. 
I, I remember a great preacher many years ago writing a great book, There's a Miracle in Your House, that transformed my life, that thought we had nothing to give, but God always has something for everyone to give that will allow a miracle to take place in your life. He knew that that man had a donkey. The second thing I want to share with you here is that the livestock owner would be able to borrow the donkey. Can God borrow your donkey? You might say, no, God, you could borrow my goat. God, you could borrow my pig, but not my donkey. That's my donkey. Paid a lot of money for my donkey. But God wants to borrow your donkey today, and I don't know what your donkey is. But you can't be a Christian long, and God can't knock on your heart and say, will you loan me your donkey? I know you bought it. I know you have a purpose for it. But right now I have a greater purpose. And it's going to meet a need. It's going to fulfill a prophecy. It's going to be a fulfillment of a prophecy. The livestock owner teaches us that Christ has a need. The Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. It's amazing that this all-powerful Jesus, all-powerful God, would ever put him in a place where he has a need in his life. But that need is to cooperate with us. You know the story. You are his hands. You are his feet. You are the heart of God. And sometimes he needs you to do something that he can't physically do. You're the epistle known and read amongst all men. Jesus isn't going to come back to this earth. It's you representing him. But he has need. He needs our gift. He needs our heart. He needs our testimony. He needs our story. He needs our smile. You can't be a Diego and and I can't be a you. And I can't reach the people you reach, but you can reach the people I can't reach. But Jesus puts himself in a place to allow us to cooperate in the reward and the blessing and whatever he's going to give us at that particular time. So the Lord has a need to fulfill something so that you could participate in it. I want to be like this livestock owner that releases what he asks of me as quickly. It would say this, the livestock owner, I bought it, but he owns it. I own it, but he gave it. I have it, but he has need of it. I'm responsible for it, but he has the authority to, 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 to use it however he wants to use it. Now, now, this was probably a Jewish livestock owner, and, and Jewish people are, are very smart, and I'm only saying that because there's a little Jew in me, and, and so, but, but he could have easily said on the back of the mule, donated by Zacharias livestock, but he didn't do that. He didn't try to make no money off of it or profit from it. I was with a friend of mine up in Oakland. And I had just finished a book that I wrote. It's the least selling book that I've ever written. And it's on mercy. Just mercy because I love the characteristic. If you had one word to describe God, what would that one word be? Mine would be mercy. It's found 100 times more in your Bible than the word grace. Yet we say grace all the time. And so I'm at my friend's desk, and I see the Ark of the Covenant, that piece of furniture in the Old Testament that carried the the, the, the Ten Commandments in them. And on the top of it was a mercy seat with the angels that were there, the cherubim. And I I was so attracted to it, and because I'd just written the book, I went over there, and I touched it, and I looked into it, and and he said, you like it? And I said, yes, I like it. I said, I just was bold. I just said, can I have it? Now, I should have said the Lord has need of it. He, he would have probably smiled and gave it to me quicker. But I'm so grateful he gave it to me. It, it, it allows me now as it sits on my desk to remember how that book was, was so meaningful to me. It connects me somewhere. The Lord has, the Lord has need of it. Almost uh, 30, 35 years ago, um, uh, there was a friend of mine, and he used to do road cycling on a bicycle. And he, he was pretty well off, and he bought the top-of-the-line bicycles that existed 35 years ago. There was, this, in our neighborhood, a young, young upcoming biathlete. Triathlete is three sports. Biathlete is two sports, which is the running part and the cycling part. He had great potential, and he, he knocked on this person's door. And he said, I live in the neighborhood, and we knew who he was because the write-ups 
at that time in the newspapers and uh, the, the fame was beginning to grow. And he said, listen, I want to take my game up to a, another level and compete, but I have a very inexpensive bike. And uh, I'd love to be able to borrow, if you would loan me one of your si- bicycles, then here's what I promise. All my fortune, all my monies that I would ever win, I'm going to give you a commission off of that based upon you loaning me your bike. The door virtually slammed, and the guy said, I don't want anything to do with you. Go just do your career. This guy became number one in the world in the biathlon and made millions of dollars. And this guy didn't see the opportunity to invest in him. He missed out on a golden opportunity. The second person that I want to introduce to you today is the donkey. Say donkey. donkey. Yeah. Now, I don't know if he looked like the Shrek donkey or... I don't know if he looked like Winnie the Pooh or donkey. I'm not sure what he looked like. But it's clearly that he was a hee-haw, hee-haw donkey. So let's talk about the donkey in this story. I understand the role that the livestock owner played in this story. If he does not do what God's asking him to do, this story doesn't come out the way it is. You play a role. In the kingdom of God. You play a significant role in in what God wants to fulfill. A prophecy. That was Zechariah 9.9. That fulfilled a prophecy that would take place. You are a fulfillment of a prophecy. Don't think down on yourself. Don't take this thing lightly. I'm a nobody. I'm insignificant. Who am I? You are a fulfillment of a prophecy. You are a fulfillment of a promise to something. Don't play it down. But now we talk about the donkey. Listen, the first thing we recognize is the Bible says that it was a young donkey and that it was a unridden donkey. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in the cattle business, anybody that has been around donkeys or horses. How many of you know that if you're going to ride it for the first time and it's never been ridden before, then what's going to happen? Is he just going to let you saddle him, you're going to hold the reins, and you're going to gently go around the corral? Or is he going to go like this? Hee-haw, 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 hee-haw. Why doesn't Jesus choose a broken in donkey? Now, I know you're L.A. people, so you can handle what I'm about ready to say. What's another name for the word donkey? You said it. I didn't say it. I come from a holy church. God, want, Jesus wants to ride the unbroken, unridden, wild, rebellious ass in you so that you would be useful for his purpose. And until you let him touch you, until you let him saddle you, until you go skin to skin with him, you and I are going to live an ass life for the rest of our lives. Never doing our thing, but never fulfilling the God-given purpose why he saved me, why he gave me gifts, why I walked away from that accident, why I survived the prisons, why I survived the overdose. I have a purpose here. And if that is that, I got to be broken, broken of my haughtiness, broken of my pride, broken of my conceit, broken of my addiction, my bondage, then God, lift your hands, break me, God, break me, God. Because until you're broken, you're not useful to God. You're not useful to God until God breaks you. The alabaster box cannot be useful until it is broken And the perfume comes out. The bread for communion has to be broken before it could be distributed. Gideon's jars that carry light in them that will pronounce the war and get them together to victory has to be broken for it to take place. Jacob has to be broken and walk around with a limp for God to turn him into an Israel, a prince of God. Jesus' body has to be broken for you and I so that by his stripes we are healed and he can redeem our lives. 
We have to be willing to allow God to break us. Number two, about the donkey. Jesus is the first to ride him. And God wants to be the first in our lives, not the last. That's what the tithe is all about, honoring him with the first. Giving God the best you before you start a day, maybe not to texting or emailing or to anything else, but I want to give God the first part of my day. I want my best emotions, my best expressions, my best affection, not to go to my work. I want to first give them to God. He wants to be your first in life. And the third thing I recognize is this, is that the donkey's purpose is to elevate Jesus on his back. His purpose is to lift Jesus up on his back. His job is to promote Jesus on his back. The donkey's job is to carry Jesus where he wants to go. To go with Jesus where Jesus wants to go. Let's talk a little bit about that donkey that you gave another name to a few moments ago. Imagine that donkey walking down the streets of Jerusalem hearing, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And his ears perk up and his tail goes back. And that ass thinks all that praise is for him. I don't know about you. This world wants to turn you into one of those. You the man. You the goat. You're the greatest of all time. This wouldn't have happened. And you say, no, it's because of Jesus in me. It's who's on my back. I'm here to elevate him. I'm here to promote him. I'm here to lift him up. So when attention is given to me because of opportunity, blessings, influence, or reward, it all goes back to him. My job is to elevate him. My job is to lift him up. My job is to promote him. It's a beautiful quality in the body of Christ, at least in the pulpit that we're losing. So many fallen preachers because they forgot that. They thought all those chairs were for them. But it's for Jesus. You wouldn't be, I wouldn't be where we are today. You're not smart enough. You're not best looking. How many, you, you, you didn't, like annuals, yearbook, you weren't the best of anything. So, in 1983, I go off to Bible school, and I'm a Southern California boy, born in Montevideo. Anybody know where Montebello is? I was born in Montebello. And so uh, I go to Bible school in Oklahoma, and I'm like the only one that looks the way I look in Oklahoma back in 1983. And, uh, but I wanted to fit in. I wanted to fit in because all the guys and all the girls over there, they wore cowboy boots. And I had never wear a cowboy boots in my life. I wore hush puppies back then. I know you guys don't know what hush puppies are. But I wore hush puppies. And so, so I go over there and I buy a pair of boots. And I wear, them, I wear them for one day and they hurt my feet. And I'm walking a little bow-legged as I put them on the next day. The next day I pull them off and I got blisters on my feet. I try them a third day, and I don't even go the third day. I throw them in the trash. And I I say, I'll never wear boots ever again in my life. Then someone came to me and said, Diego, did you break in the boots? Did you give time to break in the boots? No, I didn't. I just saw the difficulty of wearing the boots. And there are many people who say, this Jesus stuff doesn't work. This tithing stuff doesn't work. This prayer stuff doesn't work. You didn't give time to break it in. Yes. And now you're discarding it, and now you're throwing it away like it doesn't work. Yeah. It does. It does. You just got to break it in. Let God break it in to you. Just think about it, you seasoned Christians. Where you are today compared to where you were. You thought you'd never be in church let alone on a Thursday night? What happened? God broke some things out of you and broke some things into you. Let me talk about about the third person here. Well, let me read this. Psalms 51, he said, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit and you will not reject a broken and repentive heart. And here's my last point, and you've been great. Hebrews 13 says, let us offer unto him the sacrifice of praise 
proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Let's talk about the third character in the story. It's the crowd. It's the crowd that's in the story. And there are different types of people in that crowd, so I'm going to break it down just for a moment. First were the Roman soldiers. They were in the crowd. They were in the crowd because they had to be in the crowd. Jerusalem is a Roman providence. Passover is about ready to take place. Thousands of people are there, so they're trying to hold everything civil. So there's a lot of people in the church, and some people come to church because they have to come to church. I don't want to be like that. Some people come to church because they're paid to come to church. I've got people that watch over the church. They're not necessarily members. They're not Christians. They're just there because they get a paycheck. I don't want to be that kind of person in the crowd. That I, do you want to be here, Romans? Oh, I'd rather be 10,000 other places than here. But I have to be here. The second person is the disciple. And that person wants to be there. Yeah, yeah. Come on. It's not that they have to be there. They really, really want to be there. Yeah. Then there's the third person, which is the religious Pharisee that's there. These people are there to be a critic. They're there because of tradition. They're there because of duty. They're there because of ritualism. It's just something we do at Passover. We just show up. And we're there to criticize Jesus and find all the things wrong with what's going on in our church or in the kingdom of God or, or, or everything else. I don't want to be that religious person that's a critic. And then there's the fourth type of person. And those are just the people that are there because they've been invited. There are people there that just follow the crowd. You ask them, why are you here? I don't know. I just saw people going to church, so I thought I'd go to church. I just saw a crowd of people, and I knew, I, I knew they weren't for the Dodger game, so I just followed them in. And so, some, sometimes in church, in the kingdom of God, we have to look at why we do what we do. Yeah. Am I doing it because I have to? Obligation, duty. Shame, guilt, condemnation. Good, Pastor, why, why am I there? Am I just doing it because I don't have anything else to do? Because I've been invited. I'm a guest of someone. But why, why are you really there? But in all my four examples I want to share with you, in this story as we read it, they all lost their shout one week later. All of them lost their shout. And my question is, where did your shout go? Who stole your shout? What happened? Well, let's take a look at it. Maybe, maybe they stopped shouting because Jesus died. So some people stopped giving God honor, glory, coming to church, staying faithful to God, and shouting to him because I've experienced a loss in my life. And I've left the death and the law still my shout. I don't feel like shouting no more. Because I lost someone dear in my life. I thought Jesus was going to restore the kingdom. And now I'm experiencing disappointment. I didn't sign up for this. I thought it'd be a bed of roses to be a Christian. I thought I'd have all kinds of victories. I didn't know I'd have to deal with disappointment. I don't feel like shouting no more. The crisis in my life, the difficulties in my life, I just don't feel like shouting anymore. How many of you realize that for some, not in this church, in other churches, COVID stole people's shout. They were shouting before COVID, but because of the, the, the heartache and the confusion and all the narrative or whatever, they're not shouting anymore, and they've lost their shout. People haven't been back to church, and we love them, and they're watching church online, but they're not shouting the way they used to shout when they were in church, <laughs> sipping their latte, texting, and having a croissant. I'm going to say, let's not lose our shout. Here's a great quote from a friend of mine. His name is Tony Cook. And here's a quote that I'd like to read to you. He said, Jesus entered Jerusalem to shouts of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Shortly those accolades turned to the cries, crucify him, crucify him. His joy was turned into sorrow so that our sorrow could be turned into joy. So I'd like to land this plane today and kind of break it down to you today. 
why and how people lose their shout. Number one is this. Your shout won't last if it's predicated on circumstances. You cannot allow your shout to be connected to how you're feeling, to what's going on in your life, to the conditions, the situations, or the circumstances in your life. It can't be predicated on him. That's why Hebrews said, I will offer him the sacrifice. I don't feel like it. I don't want it. My circumstances tell me not to, but I'm going to lift my hands and give God all the glory and all the honor that I'm saved. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If I die, I'm going on to heaven, and I am will ever be with the Lord. Can't be circumstantial. The second thing, your shout won't last if it's just an emotion. Feeling. You can't base your relationship on Christ on a feeling or an emotion. Because how many of you know we are all fickle? We're all flaky. And sometimes we want to do something and sometimes we don't want to do something. We're all fickle, flaky, and flighty sometimes. I have seven grandchildren. And, and, and they're first into one character. They're into Mario. Then they're over Mario and they're into Sonic. I just learned the shark song. Shark do 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 Grandpa shark do 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 They're not into shark no more. I said, let's play shark no more. And they just are bored as can be and go in the other room. It changes all the time. How many of you remember puka shells were one time in? How many remember mood rings were in? How many remember wallabies were in? How many remember the thigh master was it? How many of you hairstyles like jerry curls and perms were in? How many of you remember saggy pants? Some of you walked in with that. It's over. It's over. Pull them up. We can just be so fickle and flaky all, flaky all the time. See, I don't care what people think about me. So, so I love this phrase that was like 20 years ago, bomb diggity. Wherever, somebody, how are you doing today? Bomb diggity. You say, that's so, I don't care. I like bomb diggity. I'm just going to stay with bomb diggity. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Your shout won't last if it's based on someone else's faith, someone else's testimony, or someone else's relationship that you have in your life. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ that warrants your shout. Your shout won't last if it's inconsistent. I only shout when, I only shout if. It's very inconsistent and a hit and miss. Two more points. Your shout won't last if it's not better than the shout you give the world. It won't last. If you're giving it to something else or someone else, they get the best shout and you give God a lesser version. And your shout won't last if you don't know why and whom you're shouting to. To whom and why that you are shouting. Father, thank you so much. We don't want to lose our shout, especially in this season, oh God. In Jesus' name. Why am I shouting? Because he was wounded. Why am I shouting? Because he was bruised. Why am I shouting? Because he suffered for me. He was crucified for me. He was marred. He was beaten for me. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes on me. That's worthy of a shout. I'd like to end this story. And you probably thought that there was a bird or a canary in here. But it's empty. The story told of a. 10 year old boy that had a cage like this and it had some birds in it and a man came by and he began to inquire about his birds in his cage and he asked him where did you get those he said oh I trapped them in my backyard he said how many are there he said five of them he said what are you going to do with those five little birds that you caught he said well I'm going to play with them and I'm going to have fun with them and I'm going to tease them and he said, well, then what are you going to do? He said, well, I have a cat, and I'm probably going to feed him to the cat. <laughs> the man said, well, how much do you want for those birds? He said, really, mister? He said, yeah, how much you want for those birds? He said, they're not pretty birds. They can't sing or do tricks or anything. He said, son, how much you want for those birds? He said, well, I guess maybe a dollar each. So he handed him five dollars. The man took the cage, and he went into the alley, and he opened the cage and he released the birds. There's a story told of a legend that took place 
between Jesus and Satan. Satan was boasting that he had trapped mankind in a cage of bondage. He had captured them and caught them in the Garden of Eden, and now they were bound by sin. Jesus looked at the devil and he said, what are you going to do with them? He said, I'm going to play with them. I'm going to tease them. And I'm going to torment them. And I'm going to have fun with them. I'm going to make sure their marriages end in divorce. I'm going to make sure their children are wayward. I'm going to make sure this generation is violent. I'm going to make sure they're full of hatred. I'm going to make sure they murder each other. And they're full of bondages and full of addictions. And have lifestyle issues and identity crises. And then Jesus said, and then what are you going to do with them? He said, then I'm going to damn them to hell for eternity. That's what I'm going to do. Jesus looked at Satan and the devil and he said, how much you want for him? He said, you got to be kidding. No, I want to know how much you want for him. He said, you don't want these people. They're going to despise you. They're going to reject you. They're going to betray you. They're going to spit on you. They're going to mock you. And then they're going to nail you to a cross. He said, how much do you want for them? And Satan looked at Jesus and said, if you're serious and I want all your blood. And Jesus said, you got it. Here's all my blood. And he took you and I and he opened the cage that we were in of bondage. And he set us free today. You and I don't have to be caged anymore. You and I don't have to be bound anymore. This is what this week, this is what Jesus is all about. He set me free today. Free from insecurities. Free from low self-esteem. Free from fear. Free from worry. Free from jealousy. Free from anger. Free from strife. Free from division. I don't need to have them anymore. Father, we stand now. And we give you the glory. And we give you the honor. For what you've done for us, oh God. We're not going to make this just another Easter, God. Visit us with our own revelation of who you are in our lives, oh God. And in spite of what's taken place personally in our lives over the last two years, God, we're going to regain our shout again and we're going to shout louder than we've ever shouted before, oh God, because you are worthy to be praised and it drives the enemy bonkers when we shout. It's a spiritual weapon. It ushers the presence of God. It it brings confusion in the camp of darkness. It's a weapon, a two-edged sword. So God, whether we feel like it or not, we will always offer you the sacrifice of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I just want to ask you a question today. You and I are one germ, one virus, one accident or mishap away from heaven's gate or hell's door. Tomorrow is not promised to any single one of us. You could be young and fit and our life could be banished from us. See, I used to think when I was young that the only people that die are old people like 90 years old in a hospice. But it's amazing as I've aged and especially in this season, there are people that die that are very young. How does it happen? And I don't mean to put gloom and doom on you, but in reality, they get on our freeways and they never get off because a drunk driver rear ends them. I'm a pastor, I know. They've done a double shift at work and they fall asleep at the wheel. It happens. How does it happen? They do something they've done a thousand times. It's not risky, but an accident happens and they're killed immediately. Or they go in for minor surgery. There will be no complications. But this time they can't resuscitate them or they bleed to death. I just want you just simply to be ready. I want you to live another hundred years. But should it not happen, I just simply want you to be ready. Because your humanitarian efforts of giving large sums of money away or being moral, I don't cuss and drink, or being spiritual, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, doesn't get us out of hell or doesn't usher us into heaven. Those are called works. And the only works that God recognizes the work of his son dying on the cross. And so today, Jesus is knocking on your heart and just saying, accept my work. It's done. It's paid for. You don't have any debt anymore. You don't have to walk in guilt or condemnation or shame. You don't have to earn or merit righteousness with me. Just accept that I love you. Accept that I died for you. And ask me to be your Lord. You say without a shadow of a doubt, brother, I'm saved. 
but you know what? I ride the fence of compromise. I'm in and I'm out. I'm up and my down. If my life would appear on that screen over the last 30 days, how could I say I'm a Christian and I've acted that way? Maybe I've got some stronger things in my life that I maybe need to have prayer for. When I count to three, I'm going to go one, two, three. I want you to raise your hand as a sign. I want to accept Jesus for the first time. Or I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. It'll be the best decision you've ever made. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three. Raise your hand all across this auditorium, wherever you might be. God love you. God bless you. Thank you. I see those hands. You could put them down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a simple prayer. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, you've seen everything I've done in my life. I, I can't fool you. I need help. I need a Savior to forgive me of my sins. In front of all these people, I believe that you died on the cross for me. And right now, I ask you to give me the courage now to live for you. Thank you today that I am saved and heaven is my home and I'm a child of God. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap offering. God love you, Dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just stand on your feet right now. You know, when he told that story, I was not expecting it to go in the direction it did. Where the guy was just, had those birds and no value except to mock and to tease and torment and to hurt. I thought, wow, isn't that an unbelievable picture of, of kind of where we're living in today and just someone's down, let's just drive them deep into the ground, and that's just, that's just the enemy's nature. He wants to seeks, he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And um, I don't know, that just really touched me when I heard that testimony of someone just willing to buy it back and seeing value in the tormented. And God sees value in the tormented. There's people who have been tormented here today. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just been tormented. There's some things like I just had a, 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 a vision as he was talking about maybe some kids, when their parents come home, they get excited to see them. Oh, it's good to see my parents. And then some people, man, you just hope your dad was gone longer because you, maybe you saw the shadow of a man walking down that hallway. You knew bad things were about to happen. I don't know who I'm speaking, but I feel like I'm speaking directly to somebody who just fears, who feels tormented and teased and mocked. I know this is kind of heavy, but I just feel tonight... There's people who are getting ready to just come out of that place and just be set free tonight. <laughs> Those who he says free are free indeed, the Bible says. There's an exclamation point in the end. Indeed. They are free indeed. Tonight, I want every single person who says, you know what? I'm, I'm set free. I'm free tonight. I mean, you're perfect, but you're free. God's setting you free. He said he... You're starting to believe that there's no more limitations left to your life. You're starting to believe that the things that happened to you are the worst things of your life. God is going to turn them into the best things of your life. That's how God does. God just, the world doesn't want the worst of you. But God wants the worst thing that's ever happened to you because he wants to turn into the best thing that the world can receive as a gift. I know it seems impossible. You're like, how in the world could you speak about a negative circumstance I endured in my life with such hope? Because Jesus is hope. He redeems everything. He throws nothing away. We're going to sing this last song. And God's about to cover you. He's about to surround you. When he said tease and torment, I'm like, we've sung this song before, but this is exactly what he's saying today. We're going to sing this. We're going to be out of here in four minutes. But I want every single person who wants to come out of that cage you've been locked in. You raised your hand. I'm so glad he let me come here and say this. I feel like it's in my heart to say this. But I, I feel like every single person tonight who just needs to be that bird, cage bird set free. And your walk to the front is symbolic that tonight you are coming forth into what God has for you. As we sing this song, God's about to release you and he's about to protect you into your future. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come out right now of that cage. Come out of that hurt, that brokenness, out of that abuse. With the lie that you of those words. left me on my own. I come out of agreement with the worry and the fear I've come to know. No, they won't have a hold on me. Protect you.
message for this season and this weekend. This is just such an unbelievable message. Pastor, I want to thank you for this unbelievable word. You know, it's people that go the extra mile and maybe 
attend that extra service. It seems like they always get the extra blessing. I feel like tonight was an extra blessing to just reward. You know, like, you know, sometimes movies has the private screenings for, like, the exclusive people, you know. I mean, I'm not saying you're, you know what I'm saying, but the ones that are kind of faithful, they get, like, an extra. I think you guys got a little exclusive extra tonight of, of what the Lord wanted to give you for your faithfulness. Amen. Yeah, you know, you're not more special than anybody else, but you know what I'm saying. You get it. But I'm just so thrilled. Um, so I call everybody by nickname. Baton Rouge, you want to come up? We have your testimony. Vicky? Brittany. We close. I, she's, so, she's so amazing. Will you just give a testimony? You blessed my heart the, the other day on tour. And this is, a, this is an amazing word. This, this, I was thinking about you, actually. I saw, the, the, all, I saw that bird kind of being set free and flourishing. My name is Brittany. Um, I'm 30 years old, and uh, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, I come from an amazing family. We're all super, super close. Um, I have two beautiful daughters, but unfortunately, uh, I've struggled with heroin and um, alcohol and Xanax for like the last 10 years. Um, I've been in and out of um, treatment, prison, detoxes, uh, you name it, medications. I've tried it, nothing's worked. Um, on August uh, 19, 2019, I was faced with uh, some pretty serious felony charges, which um, in return, I lost custody of my children, which is when the Dream Center was brought up to me the first time um, because my daughter's father came here twice. He graduated. And um, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go, but I lied. I didn't end up coming here. <laughs> uh, so uh, on May 10, 2021, um, my parents found me um, once again, overdosed in their home, and they were completely done with me. They were just so fed up. Um, so my aunt came get me, and I remember her telling me, like, you're going. And I was like, dude, it's another year. Like, no, I'm not trying to do it. Um, but it was, it was really for just selfish reasons. I, I really just wasn't done with my mess yet. I, I, I truly was not ready to surrender um, because I watched someone's life be completely transformed through this program. And, um, yeah, I knew that once I got here, I, I was going to have no excuse to be in my mess anymore. And uh, I was completely right. Uh, God has truly, uh, yeah. So God... God has truly uh, did a number on me. I am a completely different person than I was when I walked in these doors. Um, I read like half the Bible, which that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, yeah, um, you know, I, I truly know who God is now. I don't just cry out to God when I'm in trouble or when I, you know, need... Um, I need him to save me, you know. Uh, I cry out to him every single day. I give my life to him every single day. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about myself. Lord, we just thank you for this amazing testimony that reveals everything that this powerful message was saying tonight. That anything given to God can be turned into a life that's transformed, that can change the world, and just being available. And I thank you tonight that we just feel so refreshed. Our shout's going to return. We're going to get in the car and just maybe just shout and just keep shouting and just, and just believe for great things. And we just, this whole Easter weekend, maybe for the first time we're going to get it right. And what it's really all about as we think about your resurrection power, the same spirit that brought Jesus from the dead, the Bible says, can quicken our mortal bodies, Lord. And we thank you for that word. We thank you for those, that jumper cables of resurrection hope that we have attached to our soul through what you have done. And let us live like we are resurrected and fully charged up and ready for the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We will see you tomorrow, Good Friday, and then Sunday, 6 o'clock. We're going to have a good weekend. Have a great day. Good to see you.